Good morning, everybody. Now, today I'm going to try something a little different. It's going to be my first ever DIY. And what I'm going to do is turn a balsa wood box into a charging station. And because it reminds me of a chest, I decided I want it to look like a Harry Potter themed chest. Now, I had the idea for this after <laughs> quite a few early mornings recently, where I was being pestered by my cat Rory to wake up and get him some breakfast. Now, after a few drop kicks to the chest, Rory has now found that if he chews on all of my wires that are charging all the phones and the tablets and all the stuff on the bedside table, then we definitely wake up a hell of a lot faster. <laughs> and I said rather he didn't electrocute himself for early morning biscuits, I've decided that I'm going to try and take this temptation away from him and make a place to store all of these wires. I got this box from eBay and I'll be honest, I was really happy with the quality of it and I'm going to put links to all of the items that I used today as possible below in the description so you can find them all there. Now, I thought I might get lucky and be able to fit this extension lead through the handles on the side but they were just slightly too big and I didn't really want to have to power to a one edge of this handle so I ended up taking the plug apart and just screwing it back together once I'd laced it through. After I was happy with the position of the plug sockets I took an A4 sheet of foam board and began measuring the size that I'd need to make an internal shelf. I wanted to create a shelf so that all these plug sockets and wires would be hidden. I measured the foam board against the box itself and also using a ruler just in case this box was slightly bowed. When I cut it down I got a little bit too exact with my measurements and I had to trim it down a bit further. I'd recommend that when you measure the length and width of foam board that you need take off half a centimeter on either side because this will make it fit a lot better and we're going to be making stands for this anyway that it can sit on so it doesn't really need to be exactly perfect. To make these stands take some of your off cut pieces of foam board or just cut some strips you want them to be at least 3 centimeters wide. Now what you need to do now is measure the inside of your box and decide how deep you want the space beneath your shelf to be. I want my shelf pretty high up in the box and that way it can give me the freedom to put larger plugs into my socket and it also gives me a little bit of extra storage space inside this box for wires underneath where Rory can't get his little paws in there. <laughs> so work out how high you want them to be and cut off five foam board strips to that height. Then you want to cut another five smaller pieces of foam board, smaller rectangles that are going to sit on top of the shelf. These can be as big and small as you want them to be. I just kind of left mine at about three centimeters length and the width of them was equal to the width of the foam board strip that I made earlier. Now you want to glue these smaller rectangles onto a longer strip. These are all going to be legs that your shelf's going to stand on later on. Now I balanced mine against the side of the box just to make sure that when they set, when the glue set, it stayed at a right angle and would make the base stay level later on. Now I thought the balsa wood was a bit bright and airy for a Hogwarts box, it wasn't dark enough for me so I got some of this Jacobean oak wood dye from Wilco's to try and make it look a bit darker and, you know, more authentic, I guess. The balsa box itself is untreated, so it really took this dye well. And I'd keep that in mind if you're refurbishing an old box that's varnished or anything like that. Make sure you sand it down or try and treat it slightly before you do try and dye it. <laughs> I think I was being pretty bloody hopeful that I thought I could paint this on with a brush because I didn't have a rag and I thought well you know I can easily brush this on. No definitely I think you definitely need a rag for this job. I ended up using kitchen towel because that's the closest thing I had. What you want to do is get a layer of this dye on your box and once you've got that layer rub it all down with a cloth or kitchen towel like I did. This is going to take off any excess dye and it will make the dye look a lot more even and smooth on your box if you can get off all of this excess. Now it probably would have been a better idea to do the whole plug in the box thing afterwards unlike what I did so that you don't stain your plug but I didn't think that far ahead so I wrapped mine in an old envelope. I think this is going to be the first of quite a few tips in this video where I tell you an idea that might have been better in retrospect. <laughs> To decorate the chest and make it look a lot more authentic, I wanted to put a Hogwarts crest on the top of it. I <laughs> kind of ummed and ahed about do I want this to be Fantastic Beast theme, do I want it like a Weasley Wizard Weezers theme, but I decided I wanted to do a Hogwarts crest on the top of the box. 
Now, I can completely understand why to use the actual movie crest. It's so iconic now that you can easily, I think, use that as your stencil and save all the time of what I ended up doing. But personally, I'm not a massive fan of that crest. I think it's because it looks very much like the type of family crest you'd see in a National Trust manor house, which is great in some ways. It's, again, that feeling that she achieves through all the books that it still feels within our world. Everything is magical, but it can easily imagine it in our own universe, and that's what works so well, I think, with the themes of the book. But I don't know. I, I think that it loses some of the humour and oddness of the Harry Potter world having a crest that looks a bit too generic. So I wanted to put the creatures in slightly weirder positions that you don't normally see them in something like a family crest and have them more interactive with one another, have them almost looking at each other as if it's like them versus one another. So I tried to doodle out something a little bit different for my box. Now, I also wanted to do a bit of decoupage on this box and give it a lot more character. I like the idea of it being carried about when travelling or having sit in someone's house for, you know, like, years and years. And I like this idea of people kind of sticking Mentos onto it, or... I can't be the only person. When they were a kid, they used to get the little stickers off bananas and stick them <laughs> onto things, as if you were collecting them for some reason. And I like the idea of trying to do something similar to that. So I wanted to do a sticker version of Fever Fudge, the scaving snack boxes, and make just like a fake idea of that as if somebody stuck it onto the box. I also wanted to make some stamps from different magical places, and I couldn't really think of many that seemed like really clear ideas. I mean, other than Diagon Alley or Hogsmeade, I couldn't really think of many major magical places. And then... <laughs> While I was agonising over this, I remembered I'd already kind of done this job. I made some faux travel posters for wizarding schools the other year, and I actually sell these as prints over on my Etsy shop, wink wink. But <laughs> I thought, well, why don't I just make my life a bit easier and reuse some of those and turn them into stamps? So I took some of these travel posters and I kind of like made them a lot smaller. I wanted to make them look a bit more worn down and add stamps onto them and just make them more fun to look at, I guess. So I cut hundreds of little semicircles around the image to try and give it that kind of stamp edge look and doodle on top of them. I obviously did all seven of them before I realized there was a stamp edge custom shape on Photoshop because that is just my look. <laughs> That's what you get for not looking things up beforehand. So if you're going to plan on making stamps for your box, probably recommend using the custom shape tool rather than cutting out a hundred little semicircles around each of your images. <laughs> I also made some extra little stamps. One was for the Quidditch World Cup of Ireland vs Bulgaria, and another one was the Slytherin and Gryffindor crest that were used in the Cursed Child play. And as me and my partner are Slytherins and Gryffindors, respectively, I thought it'd be kind of fun to do. And also, we both went down to see that play earlier this year. Now, I'm not going to go off and start talking about that right now, but I think I might talk about it in a future video because it was a lot of fun, and I think I have a lot I could possibly say about it. It's a bit of a can of worms, though. <laughs> The last thing I made in Photoshop was a cover for that foam board that we made earlier. Now, I wanted something that was going to match the wood texture of the outside of the box, but I didn't want it to look like I was trying to match it too closely, so I gave it a bit of a red tone overlay to try and set it apart and make it look a bit warmer. I saved myself a bit of work in this case too by reusing the crest I made earlier and the Slytherin and Gryffindor symbols and just turning them black and making a bit of a pattern out of them onto the wood. I'll put a link to all of these little drawings in the description so that you can print out a version if you'd like to do something similar. Now when I printed these both off, I put the stamps and crest onto just a normal printer paper and the cover onto some thick matte car. Now the reason for that is because decoupage works a lot better on thinner paper and the shelf I thought is most likely to get scuffed over time so I wanted it to be made of much stronger stuff. Cut all of your stamps and decorations out and put the crest over to one side. Once they're all cut out, take the stencil that you haven't cut out yet and stick it onto some thick card. This is going to make your stencil a lot heavier. Now with the cover sheet for the shelf, 
place where you want your foam board to sit and then use a pencil to outline it onto the matte paper. Gently score those lines that you've made with a scalpel or a knife. You want to allow the paper to bend smoothly around the foam board. You don't want it to be cut straight through, so make sure you keep your hand gentle on it. Better to do like three soft scores than one thick one and you have to go print out another. <laughs> Not said from experience. <laughs> Now once your lines are scored, you're going to need to cut out some thin rectangles. Now looking back at this footage, I feel like this might be a bit confusing. Basically what I'm doing is I'm making some small 0.5 centimeter squares at the end of one side of my shelf. I'm going to doing this because I want to lace through my leads when I place this shelf in. Now I want the hole I'm making to be small enough to fit the lead through, but not large enough for the micro USB end to keep falling to the inside of my shelf. Now I'm cutting the paper to exactly reach the edges of the cuts of the foam board, and I'm doing that because it's a lot easier than folding a very very small overlap into these spaces and we can tidy up these edges later. After this you want to fold the edges that you scored around the sides of your foam board and adjust anything that feels funny and cut it down if you feel like it's a bit too large. It's easier to do this now than it is a bit later. <laughs> On the edge where I cut out the little squares, I decided to fold this fully around the board rather than cutting it to sit along the edge of the foam board. The reason I did this is because I thought the paper would be weakest at this point because I would be moving wires and lacing things through. It's going to get the most damage, so I wanted this to be the strongest part. And on the other edges, I could just cut it down to fit the side of the foam board. Next, you want to put a massive amount of glue onto that main flat part of your cover. I use something that's called tacky glue. It's a somewhat stronger form of PVA that's good for using on wood and plastic, but it's not as difficult to control as super glue. You want to put some heavy on this to make sure that it's going to stay smooth. Now moving on to the legs that we made earlier, arrange them how you want them to be around your box. I made two smaller legs that were going to be towards the front, underneath the side where I left the gaps for the wires, and then I used the larger legs to go on the three other sides. I'm trying to find a way of distributing the weight of this shelf evenly around my box, and I I'd focus on doing that if your box is a different shape from this one. In this case, I would recommend a tacky glue or super glue rather than PVA because you're trying to adhere somewhere onto wood and it's got to take a bit of weight, so you want to know that this is definitely stuck on strongly. Hold the legs in place until they aren't pulling themselves off <laughs> and, and leave them to dry. Now hopefully your shelf will be pretty much dry now and you can move on to sticking the sides of the paper onto the foam board. Now I'm going to use tacky glue again and I'm pulling the paper tight onto the foam board. I'm letting the glue set there for a few minutes before I get some washi tape and tack that on to keep it in place. Now you could use masking tape, really any tape on this case, any would work because you're not really going to see this side very much if ever <laughs> and this is more just to keep it in place once it's all nice and dry. I got a bit of black acrylic paint and I painted into all the gaps or wherever some of this white foam board was showing. Now when it's placed in the box, you're not really going to be able to see any of the edges, they're going to appear very dark. So using a darker colour for your internal shelf is a pretty good idea. Now, I'll be honest, the first time I tried to make this stencil, I messed it up, and this is my second go. <laughs> now, the stencil is a bit of a point of contention for me in this DIY, and I kind of questioned even keeping it in the video. You see, my original plan was to cut out all the white sections of this image, save all of them, place them onto the box later on, and then paint blankly on top of it. Now, you see, as I carry on and I do that, it doesn't really work. The trouble was, I couldn't really adhere the stencil onto the wood as closely as I think I needed to to make the paint look good. Reason for that being that I didn't treat the wood dye after I painted it on and I worried a great deal about damaging the wood dye and ending up having to redo it just on the top which would make the dye look very different and darker on just the top of the box which I really just didn't want to do because I knew it would be very hard to correct. So by copping out and not adhering the stencil closely onto the box, the lines were very messy in the paint and the paint was very uneven and just didn't look very good. So what I would recommend is use the stencil if you want to use it, but only use it to create the pencil outline onto the box and then hand paint the crest yourself. Don't rely on the stencil because it's not necessary and it is going to be difficult to do but it will save you a lot of time and pain because I ended up having to blend an acrylic paint that was a similar colour to my box 
I had to then add all of the brown details again because of how much the gold had gotten messy and I had to sandpaper it down multiple times so the glue didn't build up too thick on the surface. It was a lot of extra little bits of work as you can see and I would just say you'll probably make less mistakes trying to hand paint it and sanding it once when little bits go a bit wrong than you will do trying to repaint every edge multiple times as I did. I used metallic acrylic paints for this and I lightly sanded them at the end anyway just because I wanted them to look a bit duller but if you want them to look a lot sharper I'd just leave them metallic as it is or maybe using a metallic ink as well. <laughs> Now, as you might have realised at this point, I'm not taking this project too lightly. So I looked online for some hardware for this box. And I wanted something that looked antique and brassy in colour and had maybe a bit of a magical motif. And I found these box edge corners and latches on Etsy and eBay and I'll link them both below. Oh, I chose to hammer the nails <laughs> into this box and I honestly think I could have just glued them and made my life a lot easier. But... I think you can tell by this box that I didn't make that choice. <laughs> and you know, who doesn't want an excuse to bust out the stubby hammer and make a racket in the flat, you know, because I am the best neighbour that has ever existed. <laughs> because these are super tiny nails, I ended up using some jewellery pliers just to hold them in place while I hammered them. And it made life a lot easier. So if you do have a moment of madness like me, make sure you get some jewellery pliers to hold these or else you're not going to have your fingers left by the end. Now as I mentioned a little briefly before, if you make your shell fit a little bit too closely to the inside of your box, you're going to struggle to remove it when you finally place it in there on its stand. So what I did is I folded over some brown ribbon to make a pull handle. Now I pinned this folded over ribbon into place with some of these baby nails I got with the hardware I showed and then I added some glue when it was in place to make the handle a lot stronger. Now I wanted the box lid to hold open at roughly 90 degrees when I opened it rather than clatter backwards like it was doing. You want to take the length of ribbon and cut it down to two equal lengths. Now the way you're going to find that length, you need to hold the box lid open at the angle you want it to be held and measure a strip against this. Factor in too that you also need to keep about two centimeters extra on each side of that ribbon. Now I'd recommend using some books to prop open that box lid while you measure it. This will give you the chance to measure it a couple of times and make sure that the length's correct and also to use a pencil to mark where you want the screws to go on your box as a guide later. Now on one end of that ribbon that you've just cut, fold over two centimeters and prick the centre of where those two bits of ribbon have met. Now use that guide hole you've made and use a pair of scissors to cut a little small cross where the dot has been. Now this is going to stop the ribbon getting all scrunched and screwed up when you turn the screw later on. Now put the screw through the hole you've just made and place the area of the ribbon on the first guide pencil dot you've made on the box and screw it in until it's pretty much to the edge of the wood. Give yourself a little bit of a gap just so you can attach the other side of the ribbon easily. Once that's in place, screw in the other side. This is all pretty hard to explain so I'm really hoping the footage explains this well. So I really hope the footage is making this clearer. Now you want to add some more of your tacky glue onto these folded sections of your ribbon. This will make the fabric stronger around the area where the screw is and it's going to keep it, all of your threads a lot tighter in general too. Then just finish screwing it all as tightly as you can to the box and there you go that's one side and hopefully this is going to make it a lot easier because you're going to have to repeat this step on the opposite side. This is definitely the hardest part of this project. <laughs> Don't feel disheartened if you have to give it a few tries. I was really glad that I bought a meter of this ribbon just to give you an idea of how many times this took me. <laughs> After that you can relax because you're just going to start doing your decoupage of all these decorations we made earlier. Now pour a generous amount of PVA glue. I'm using a postage stamp to hold mine because it's a lot easier to throw in the bin later. Paint the back of the stamp with the glue and stick it into place. You might want to arrange these on a table or box before gluing them on to make a nice arrangement. Or you might just want to wing it like me because you're overly confident. Either way seems to work. Then coat the top with a lot of PVA glue and use an old brush or spatula to wipe off all the excess glue. You want the surface is to be the smooth layer of thin PVA glue. Repeat this with all the decorations. I was actually originally planning on putting these decorations around the outside of the box, but after the die turned out a lot nicer than I expected it to look, I kind of changed my mind and decided I just wanted them to be seen when you first open the box. 
So I just kept it all limited to the inside panel. Now when you're done, use an old brush and paint the entire inside where you covered the stamps in a thin layer of PVA glue. This is going to make it all look uniform and protect them with a second layer. Now it will dry clear and honestly doesn't have a very glossy look but it will make your wood appear darker so try and keep that in mind if you do plan on putting it on the outside of your box and oh my god it is done <laughs> get those charges in and cover it with the shelf you made earlier with there being such a large cavity under the shelf you can easily use it to store up all these other wires or goodies that your cat enjoys chewing <laughs> now i was pretty shocked with how nicely this turned out and i would definitely recommend making it Taking in the cost of materials, I'd say this put me back about 15 quid. And considering you can find charging stations online that are a quarter of this size and not really as fun looking for 25, 30 quid, I really think that this is a good gift either for yourself or for someone else considering the time of year I'm putting this up. It offers a lot of chance for you to personalise it too. I mean, I went the Harry Potter route, but I can already think of a load of different ways I think I could have taken this. And I can imagine you guys will have even better ideas than that. So I really hope you give this a go. If you do, I'd really love to see it. I'm over on Instagram at Jasmine Todd Illustration. The link's down in the description too. And I really would love to see it if you do make one. Oh, I really hope these instructions made sense. <laughs> but if you do have any questions or any thoughts on it, just leave me a comment below and I'll get in touch with you as soon as I can. I really hope you enjoyed this first DIY. I'll be honest, this project's a lot easier to do than it is to explain, so don't feel worried about giving it a go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.